me. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very full panel. I, I just want to take a moment to like say to everyone, thank you so much for sharing your work, your hard, hard work, and your dedication. And of course, it's not easy being an artist, actually, right? There's all these ups and downs and lefts and rights and money. Like, uh, where do you find money, you know? Uh, things like that, like it's just really uh, um, the learning, the acquired learning that we uh, as artists uh, have as a result of encountering an idea, but also making or thinking through an idea. Uh, it's very, very important, so thank you all again. Uh, and I, I just uh, want to share the prompt for this part of uh, the conversation. Um, and mostly, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I think we're all interested in uh, fluid uh, space, right? So there's this prompt here which will start our conversation, but as we introduced ourselves to each other, um, there might be questions that you have for each other or each other's practice. So please feel free to take the mic, take the conversation where it needs to go. Uh, and then folks in the room, eventually uh, we will open up. Eventually, you'll be invited. <laughs> um, there's a beautiful question that uh, the organizers uh, shared with me, and I did my best to share with you before we all gathered together. Um, and thinking about embodiment through practice, thinking about how practice connects us to community, to culture, um, and also how, community, how practice connects us to future ancestors, right? And so the question that we're going to start with is uh, how do these methods, the methods that you folks employ in your making, enrich indigenous culture, cultural revitalization, and or urban indigenous communities? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Um, I feel like one of the things that's very apparent in all of our work is that there's a very wide variety of ways to experience indigenous culture and indigenous urban culture, um, and that the more that's reflected in different ways, um, I think that the, that's how stereotypes get broken, and also how people feel um, a place for themselves and their voice. And so I just want to celebrate how different all of our work and backgrounds are. And it was really a pleasure to see that today. Um, thinking about embodiment, um, a lot of the work that you showed at the beginning, and I was thinking about that um, everyone was sharing. Um, and then the the students that I have at Anelkin, um, and we were uh, gracious enough to see one of them, um, Madeline Trabaskin, who was also embodying coyote. Um, but at um, being centered, being able to be centered in a place um, as, uh, as a teacher, as a professor with um, all my community, amongst my community members and people from the land in which we come from, and then lots of other indigenous people that come to Anakin from all over um, Canada and North America. It's really, I feel very blessed to be able to interact with as many different kinds of people, um, indigenous people that come in, in that space and also still be celebrating um, the place in which my people are from at the same time. So to always be acknowledging those two things at the same time is um, a huge gift. And not necessarily um, something that can be happening all the time every day. Um, and so was there really like how you talk about like bringing your family with you and like um, embodying them in the postcards and all those things with you 
And um, I think about like when I was away, when I was doing um, my scholarship, um, how I would kind of tote around those things and make sure I had pictures of everybody on my walls and stuff to, to remember um, what it is that I needed to remember. So I think all of um, the people here today, like in different ways, all of the embodiment is really clear. Like you have the ancestors with you all the time and then you have um, yourself and then you also do have the future with you all the time. And I have two wild things that are the future that are the embodiment of living everything um, every minute. But um, my two boys also um, represent like a reconnection of of our in indigenous trade routes and all of those things that we had connections of of uh, vastly wide connections. Um, through family and through trade and through all of those things, but um, they're an embodiment of that. So we are um, more living and more present than than a, the wider uh, world view really sees Indigenous people, right? We are actively being that every day. So it's just something that I was thinking about of well, we're doing that every day, everywhere that we walk, the children that we have, the people that we know, the friends that we have, all of those things besides all of the scholarship that we do, or besides all the actions that we make. So, we, we are all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, to, to just bounce a little bit on that, uh, that yes, no matter what our background is, it doesn't mean we're um, the, the, the scholarship is not creating the root, but the uh, connection is, and uh, yeah, so, so yeah, to, to the <laughs> like his eyes going up. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think within my own practice, like embodiment really does mean taking the spirit and the thoughts of what I'm thinking about um, in regards to my family and putting it into the work and like manifesting it into these tangible physical items that can then live in different ways. Um, but it also means different things in different places. Like I, because I don't live on my territories, every place that I go to, I have to kind of embody a certain like quality, I guess, uh, that is specific to my nation and the knowledge that I hold from that um, and like what my responsibilities towards that is and what I share and what I don't share and um, it was really like going to stop me um, and being with Sami artists like that was just put into such a uh, really clear contrast for me about like what I was there and what I was bringing and what things were contrasting and yeah I felt really I felt really really like very responsible about how I was conducting myself um, and how how to make my family proud like I'm the only person in my family to graduate from post-secondary since my mom did so there's a little bit of pressure <laughs> to do well <laughs> well I just want to say first of all Karen and Shanique for sharing about each of your practices because it's really really beautiful for me to to um, to listen and to hear more about what each of you are doing. And I think uh, I feel really honored to hear that and to be present and to kind of take with me a little bit about what each of you do um, and to reflect on it. Uh, in terms of this particular question, I feel like um, I feel sometimes a little bit quiet because I, I need time to think and uh, you know to kind of process and to spend time with the question although I have been spending time with this kind of idea for a while um, which is what I spoke about today um, but I really really appreciated some of the comments about um, being away from your home territory I think that that's 
really resonates with me as someone who's lived in Anishinaabeg territory and been to be seeing Anishinaabeg territory for a decade and prior to that uh, lived in uh, Treaty 6 um, Edmonton for nine years so I've been away from my homelands for a really long time and um, and so I think that's where questions of embodiment become really important for myself because I live so far from home and I certainly consider my responsibilities not only to my home and people ask me, when are you coming home, Tanya? <laughs> that is often the question uh, from my friends from high school who are artists as well or who are doing uh, work that's very much focused on cultural revitalization or resurgence. And I have gone home. I've gone home and and done different projects with youth primarily uh, in dance and in language revitalization. Um, but as someone who lives far from home, uh, I'm perpetually homesick, uh, so I'll just say that first and foremost. Um, but I also think about the way I conduct myself in other places. I do a lot of listening when I'm in other people's territories, and I'm always trying to think in relation to those places and to think about how does that align with my own thinking or my own experiences. Um, I also think that maybe in the old days we were more mobile than we give ourselves credit for. <laughs> you know, I've really enjoyed listening to people talk about trade routes and those kind of larger connections here in, um, in BC. Uh, because we kind of carry with us this idea that we were uh, only in these very small places, but actually um, we were visiting, we were traveling, we were marrying other people. <laughs> we were, my great grandfather is actually um, Clinkett. Uh, he was an orphan, and the Lutic people adopted him and brought him to my island. And so, at least that's the story. So, um, so I often, uh, like I said, think about being homesick, but also um, think about how um, I'm kind of the main teacher for what it means to be Lutic to my children, and I'm a mother as well. So as a mother, as someone who has a responsibility to my children to embody to the best of my ability what it means to be a Lutic, um, that's important. But I also think about uh, the complexities of our lived experiences. And so um, my experience of being a Lutic is very different from many other people's. And that's kind of layered with class and gender and uh, you know being heterosexual and all of those things all of those pieces um, are layered into that embodiment of uh, eluticness uh, in this moment and in this time so I don't know if I answered your question Peter I feel like it's such a big question it is a good question. But I really appreciate everyone's um, contributions. And the other thing I want to say, I just want to echo Ryan, that I think that we all have different contributions as artists. We all have different strengths. We all have different um, ways of being. And that that difference is important because that means we all contribute um, in a different way. And uh, I really value that. <laughs> I'll drop it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I um, well, I have two questions. And I, the last time I was able to facilitate on this stage was a very interesting moment in time. And um, uh, the panel we worked it was a quite a big panel and uh, of um, global folks, uh, indigenous folks. Uh, we had two questions. Actually, that was it. We only had two. The first question was, uh, how do you acknowledge where you are? Yeah. And then the second question was, uh, what do we need to build now? 
and I think maybe this will be an interesting space for us to move forward in our conversation um, as builders, because we are, you know, we build things. We build the beadwork sometimes as makers. There's something that happens, right? So what, let's change it. What do we need to make now? Well, something came to mind right away when you're talking about that. Um, well, uh, first and foremost, I think we're doing that right now, and this has been doing that right now, um, this whole residency, but building connections, we need to re really rebuild lots of connections um, amongst our all of our indigenous peoples and even all of our, within our communities, how they kind of become silos because of how the government has um, organized that space, right? So um, even within um, our Silk territory, we have all our communities up and down the valley, but we are not separate people. But there's this idea, there was some talk um, from different elders saying like, you know, some of our kids, they think that we're all different people in all these communities and they don't realize that like, all of our families even have um, members in all of our communities. And so that was a, a little disconcerting to me because um, just growing up and even um, in that short span of thinking that our, our youth think that we're all separate, um, I think elaborates on a symptom that's been happening of because of all these other responsibilities that we have in um, negotiating our spaces in, in um, different worlds of like whatever jobs we have or where we live or all those things that's disrupting our connection, disrupting our connection to ourselves, to our families, to our people, to each other as indigenous people um, who used to trade and knew very well like all these different um, ways of communicating and um, having a relationship. So we need to continue to really work on that because I see even within families that that's actually still eroding a bit because even because of everybody's responsibilities and how much um, pressures are from the outside especially within all these systems that are enact, trying to enact upon us there's less and less time that people can get away to be connected to each other so intergenerationally like even um thinking about when I was little how every um, birthday even if people live far within like the greater plateau area which encompasses um, a few um, provinces and like three states the, the area of the plateau um, which all my family live all over the place um, everyone usually still came together right for like my grandmother's 70th birthday or my aunt's 80th birthday or um, different graduations or at least one time a year or a few times a year at the Christmas time when people had time off everyone would come together well now that's starting to erode even more to the point that lots of people don't get to see each other even one time a year right so I was just thinking about how counter that is to most of um, many people you know lots of indigenous people's way of um, traditional being of always coming together or always um, having connection for um, many different gatherings, right? Namings or real formal things that, that lots of potlatches are for or um, are different kinds of ceremony too. But all those things are being impacted and having to be readjusted sort of to like fit into this um, colonial matrix that's that's enacting upon us so like um, ceremonies are adjusted in certain amounts of days or whatever because people can only have certain amount of time off and all that kind of stuff we've had to interact and deal with with that like really in a in a physical and in a very lived way of the moment so we still 
it seems to me, I mean, the best way to do that is just to keep pushing back. We have to keep pushing back because that's another way of um, enacting erasure upon all of our people, right? As if we can't connect to each other, if we can't come together as um, different kinds of communities, then that's interrupting us to the point that it's um, trying to stagnate growth. And all of us are growing so so much, like every artist and um, children and families and communities are, like actually really living, growing beings and entities of, it, of itself besides um, whether we're away or close. But we definitely need to just keep communicating and rebuilding those connections. It's the biggest thing, it seems to me, because of that erosion. Right, because just like when you build a house on top of the mountains, like what's happening here, too much, it starts to, uh, uh, you know, erode, like and and interfere with the the plant people and the animal people and all that. Well, those things within these structures are doing that, and so we need to actively interrupt. Of course, always start a revolution of some kind, even every little thing. <laughs> Which we were like, no, we're going to do a dip, the panel a little bit different today. We're, we're interrupting that. But like, just, you know, sometimes lots of interruption is good. Just like lots of silence is good. Uh, so something I didn't talk about in my presentation is that I do curatorial work as well. Um, so most recently we did the Together Apart Queer Indigeneity Symposium in Vancouver through the Grant Gallery. Um, and the big topic of conversation is like, what do we need to make? And I think for a lot of Indigenous queer folk right now, what we need um, is for people to make space for us and to make safe spaces for us, because like even though I have this like profound homesickness um, uh, about going home, one of the main reasons that I don't is the Catholic Church has impacted my community so in such a devastating way that I, I do fear for my safety when I go home. And if I don't have my uncles around me, like I don't really trust that I'm going, like my survivability feels a lot lower. So like, even though I love being on the land and I feel really held and present and like there's so many different parts of the world that come together there for me, uh, that's often very disrupted by a lot of the colonial issues that have manifested in our community. Um, so to me, making more spaces and making a part of this resurgence, um, making it possible for queer people to just exist in a safe way and be respected and listened to is um, like my dream and my the work that I do um, or try to do. And uh, I was reading this article by Kath uh, interviewing Catherine Paul, who is Black Belt Eagle Scout, who is amazing. Um, and they were asking her about mentorship and Catherine, they're the same age as me, I think. So we're both about 29, that kind of age range and um, the question directly was like do you consider yourself a mentor and I think for me that was sort of something that was scary to me because it's like I'm not old enough to do any of that but the reality is like our community the indigenous queer community is so small and we have such a gap in our generations because of things like the AIDS crisis um, we have to be able and ready to mentor each other maybe sooner than we wanted to Well, I was, I always lament that I am not a maker of objects and, um, you know, I uh, said that recently to, um, to someone who I kind of work peripherally with uh, uh, in North Bay, Ontario, where I live, and uh, he's a really funny nice man and he said but you make things happen <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was like the nicest thing I've heard in a really really long time I thought oh yeah <laughs> um, 
because I, I often think about people in my home community, but also just um, Indigenous women generally, uh, you know, who make beautiful, beautiful things, who bead, and also Indigenous men and queer folks, and who make beautiful objects. And there's like this inability for me to make objects. <laughs> um, so I think a lot about um, this other thing that I'm good at, which is making things happen. And um, I've been thinking a great deal lately about, um, you know, for a long time, um, I mean, I feel like I come from such a tiny place, and I do, I come from a very small community. And uh, for me to even get, kind of enter into these uh, museum spaces, uh, sometimes can feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I always consider how important it is for me to bring others with me, to bring, or to, to, to the best of my ability to make space for other folks. And um, so I've said in the past that I think about uh, expanding the conceptual space um, for Indigenous peoples in museums and in universities. Um, those are kind of the two spaces that I interact with the most. And that's certainly been a part of my uh, labor, a part of my work, and something that I need to continue to do. Um, part of it is that, and I said it in my talk, I kind of make a community uh, when, I, when I do these projects. It's an opportunity for me to connect with people, to be in relation, to think alongside one another, and to be together in that space for that period of time. But I've also been thinking a lot about how I'm very privileged um, and thinking about, you know, ways in which I've been privileged and ways in which, um, you know, it's really important to, to make space for other folks, but also to learn from other people, you know, to really listen and to really learn um, because uh, I don't have all the answers. I have a, a, a tiny bit of knowledge and tiny bit of experience and so by listening and learning and helping to make space for other folks um, I hope that that's a generous action well, I don't want to do too much um, just be saying I feel like you guys said a lot of really amazing things but I was really drawn to the idea of making revolution and um, in my work I try and make a lot of space for introspection um, because I feel like we're our you know our society is crafted and imposed a lot by other forces and the, the time you take to um, delve into to serious introspection and to think about like why you have the views that you do, like whether they're coming from the infiltration of the Catholic Church, for example, or from a colonial structure, um, is the first and most, power, most powerful way to undo those things. Um, so I think making a lot of room for introspection, for people to understand themselves, their communities, their histories, is really important. And then lastly, again as an echo, to um, make scaffolds, um, you know, to bring other people up with you. And as you to, to build community as you go and keep making more and more room for other people to come with you. Um, and I've also been really interested in um, creating for that reason as well. Um, I'm actually going to start a master's program in um, Bergen this fall. And I never saw myself as being that type of administrator. Um, I saw myself as an artist, but I just feel like there's so much wonderful work in our community that we need more and more to, to get them out there and get that recognized and um, a lot of that's through exhibition, international <coughs> exhibition and, and academic writing and, and these things that um, have been, could have more attention drawn to our communities. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, before I invite our friends here, um, is there any questions that emerged for you folks, for each other, or questions?
questions are hard. I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, folks in the audience, do you have any? Just take the mic in case anyone has a question. Oh, wait, I thought you had a question. Uh, even a comment, yeah. you know, like. Just Actually, I, I have a comment. Oh, great. I'm going to be the mic for people, but um, I was so profoundly moved by the choices of your words today, Tanya, and some of the things that really struck me. Um, was when you were talking about nurturing the object, um, that gave me a new lens that I had never considered before. And um, all everything that sort of lives within that, which then when Soleil was talking about um, her experience under that pelt in that moment and through, it, it just sort of, it all really drew some beautiful threads um, and Ryan, I uh, saw your exhibition at the Alternator last night and um, loved the uh, way that you invite the community into the work, into the conversation. And um, I think that is resonating with all of the things, all of what you're doing right now. And um, I am absolutely moved and filled with gratitude for a new, a lot of new learning, a lot of new knowledge, um, and ways to ask questions in terms of relating to this kinds of work and to the responsibilities that I have. So, um, I just really wanted to thank. And there's, I mean, there's so many other things. The incarceration of those objects. Like when you said that, I was like, I was really struck that particular phrasing. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to express my gratitude for everybody who's bringing amazing people together to have um, fantastic conversation. So I can pass the mic off to anyone who has a question or comment in the room. Oh, yeah. All right. Let me uh, uh, I'm coming to you. Just in case, you can talk. Okay. Start it. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, really don't like microphones. <laughs> okay. um, uh, yeah, so many wonderful connections and beautiful threads between all of your uh, your insights. Uh, what Again, I don't have a question, but uh, uh, what seems uh, to really come through is this sort of reconceptualizing time and space in different ways. And uh, what seemed to come through is to challenge that idea of colonial time and space with these new sorts of uh, makings and buildings uh, and this idea of community and I think uh, not only from hearing your talks and about your works you have as people who are able to sit here and, and to listen and to learn have just like opened up and built that community even larger I, I would say I mean I hope uh, and I think that's like really um, a part of that decolonial process and, and project so I just want to say thank you again to all of you uh, because it's it's part of that work that we continue to do and uh, bringing in uh, the institution or places like universities uh, while still problematic is still where we're doing this work right now too. So, thank you. Oh, right here in the front. Where? Uh, sure. Oh. Thank, thank you all. It's uh, um, amazing to, to hear those uh, uh, a plethora of voices like that. Uh, thank you, Peter, for moderating uh, this, uh, this session. Um, uh, Ryan, I, 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 was, I was struck by a comment you made, and I think a very important one, about uh, when you're producing work, uh, to not um, buy into the kind of, I guess it's a type of cultural capital that's out there where you're reproducing trauma. And uh, and you, I think it was very very astute, right? And, and I, I see all the work on the people on the panel resisting that because that's that trauma can be consumed and can be uh, made something in the art world in a way that uh, that simply uh, retains the status quo, creates that, that problem. So I thank you for that comment. I'm wondering if you might want to talk further about um, methods to 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 resist that, to resist what's being sometimes asked from from art communities. I think particularly of, of 
Soleil's work uh, and listening to West's work that that sort of resonates in, in that, but of course across the panel as well. So I wonder if you could talk more about resisting trauma reproduction. Um, I'll, I'll speak to a specific instance that also relates to that piece. Um, so with that piece, there was also programming. And so I was encouraged to um, have a, a, a conversation with um, residential school survivors in that space um, in regards to the programming. And I kind of asked myself the question, like, who is this for? And I think that that's one of the biggest questions. And the audience in that space was not going to be for um, the people who experienced that. It's going to be uh, through spectatorship. So I declined, and I, instead I gave a history lesson as my, as my programming. Um, but I think that that's one of the biggest questions in, in deciding um, how, how that is produced, is to, is to look at um, who, who, who is engaged in this conversation and what do those people have to like, access. And so when I made this piece, I was making it about like, myself and the way I was thinking about this, that, that issue, but also I kind of had a, a little bit of an academic lens on it too. Like I didn't dig into and display personal trauma, which of course is for a decision that everyone makes independently. Some people are more comfortable with that than others. But um, in my case, I wanted to have a little bit more of an academic conversation as well as communicate a very specific um, specific idea, which is which was this idea of that this is this is all around you, this is all around us, and that has uh, major impacts. And I think that forming that intentionality as well as it is an excellent way to, to do that is to decide exactly what you're trying to communicate and what your goals are. Um, I did another piece that was about um, uh, a war crime um, in the Pacific Northwest um, and had a lot to do with genocide. Um, and I approached it through a point of uh, healing, celebration, and recognition. Um, and I think that the more you direct your intentions, the better you can avoid falling into those traps of capitalizing on, on suffering. Just anyone else have thoughts about that question? Uh, so when I was going to Emily Carr through the uh, DFA program there, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was happening at the same time, like all of the events were happening in Vancouver. And I was like 22 and um, it was kind of my first time living in a city, my first time in an institution that big. And <coughs> all of this was happening. and. Uh, being one of the few indigenous students at the school at the time, there was so much pressure to produce a certain kind of artwork. Um, and I'm actually moving out of my place right now and was going through some of my older projects that I just hadn't had the heart to like get rid of yet. Um, but they're, they're works that I've kind of just buried because they're really hard to look at. They're, it's one of the first times I started going through archives and they're just things I never want to show anymore. Like I made them because I was responding to this like demand that was happening and I felt so bad about that but couldn't contextualize for a long time why that was. But it was because this work that I was making was consumable for this conversation that's happening outside of indigenous communities. Um, so I did a bit of a ceremony for them and have like disposed of them in a way that feels good for me um, and in a way that they won't be taken up by someone else. Um, but I think that experience of like going through a university program at the same time that people were being put out into public spaces to share their trauma as a way of educating was so impacting on how I make my work now. Um, because it's like I also have had to deal with a lot of trauma and I think there are instances where I overshared and like I'm even still residually embarrassed for it and now I have to like deal with this embarrassment about having shared these things that were maybe too personal and in contexts where they weren't um, received 
respectfully necessarily or not maybe just not received with understanding the gravity of what I was giving um, yeah I think a lot of the work that everyone's sharing here today as you said is resisting kind of that I just I'm thinking of three words that I said in the talk which are strategies for performance that I work in and through which is concision uh, refusal and abstraction and I think particularly in relation to embodiment um, and sort of working in in relation to these very difficult histories um, that those are important strategies for my own work um, and to be quite honest this is the first time I've ever talked about these particular histories publicly um, and I tend to really try to navigate ethically uh, the ways in which I name specific histories from my island. I also, you know, recently I'm, sh well, I'm showing a work that deals with embodied memory of a very specific event on my island. And so when the curator sent the description of the event, I was shocked when I read it, <laughs> or shocked when I read the description of the work, because I never name that history in that way. And so I you know, scrambling to respond. And of course this went out to the other artists in the exhibition and I thought, oh no, they're all going to think that, you know, I wonder about their own responses to the way in which that was described because that's not how I represent the, the very painful histories on my island. And so I think that these are ethical questions about the, the ways in which we address history and the strategies for me in performance specifically are concision, refusal, and abstraction. Uh, I think that, uh, I'll try to choose my word properly, but the, the display of, of a personal hurting or personal history always comes off as being a very um, I don't know, uh, hurtful sometimes, or too much sharing. I don't think there's too much sharing some in, in relating to others as well. Um, we can only talk about our own body memory, not the body memory of someone else. I have the body memory of my ancestors, yes, it follows me, and that I carry within my, my body, my, my skin, my, my breathing, because it's been passed down, right? And, uh, a lot of that memory I didn't know about even before later within my life because uh, the history was not told right? uh, or hidden. Even hiding who we were as Indigenous was a part of it. Um, since sometimes uh, the body of work has to be raw, I don't have an education. I, I, I dropped off of every school I've ever been to, even, um, uh, well, the high school, but even uh, I was not good at elementary school. Uh, they wanted to throw me off, and my mom kept me going. Or it was really, it was a very interesting experience. The four walls has always been uh, troubled. So, so my learning was not within school systems in general. So all I had to rely on was my body, the body memories of my ancestors and the people that surrounded me, because that was my education, and that's and that includes the, the territory I was walking on. So I think that my feet are walking with that history. Um, therefore, when I when I create and when I present on stage, I do have those hurt and I have those healings and I have those feelings, and I share it with others, not in the wanting to um, to show my pain, but more to relate with one another and communicate in ways that we can all understand. It's like where we step our feet and where we where we put words or sound. Um, it is all interconnected and it's all. There. I was just thinking about um, how even um, within the, the small um, preview of the film that I had about the borderland issues within our territory, every um, work that, that, any, that has included any um, other family members or community members or anyone that always um, have generally, like, really... Um, 
have them speak about whether whatever it is that they want to share or feel comfortable sharing, right? To give them space whether they want to share great amounts of that or not. Um, the the question is though of audience, like um, what you were talking about, Ryan, is really uh, a good thing to think about. Like if who who something is for, that question is always in my mind depending on what I'm making or what I'm um, working with. It if you're making um, like that film is for not not really for the general public. That film about um, our struggles with with um, militarization and all that within our borders and all of that for our still people that's for our people or for other indigenous people right for empowerment of ourselves so it depends on the context in which you're you're viewing or to be viewed right of where people feel comfortable or not and Wes I was thinking about what you were saying about you know, um, interacting with those pressures of what kind of work you're supposed to be making. Um, and in lots of, you know, um, overly renowned um, fine arts programs and stuff, and if you're like the one or a couple indigenous students that are in it, there's always this pressure of what they think you should be making and what it is that is, inspires you to Right? So I really um, think like sometimes it's easier to just not be in that space and to be making whatever it is that you want to make or to always, you always have to like enact like small revolutions or um, combating those things every time that you have to step into the classroom or every time you're making pieces or deciding whether or not you're going to share certain parts of those things in pieces or um, how that is viewed, right? And so that's a lot of pressure for for all of our peoples and, and, and all the different communities um, in which we come from, even in the different ones within our ourselves, because they're always wanting to tokenize all of us, right, in, in any of those kind of spaces. And so I'm just thinking, like, it's, it's really good to be very precise about standing up and saying, well, no, we can't do it that way, because that's going to um, be toxic, like, to the people that are sharing or reliving certain things that they're sharing, right? The space has to be safe for them first, not just um, something that's consumable, right? But that um, a lot of times when um, institutions of like museums and um, even galleries or things like that don't have um, any, a lot of indigenous input, their first question is they're not necessarily being, trying to be um, colonial, like have those toxic ideas, but they don't realize the the question that they're asking people to do, right? Um, and so I think there's there's this whole thing of people putting on indigenous people all this responsibility of educating the masses. Well, that's not our responsibility. They they need to be responsible for themselves to know that those kind of questions really shouldn't be asked in that way. Um, because we have to always um, negotiate all these spaces ourselves and we're not asked to do those things like that. Oh, well, can you handle doing that or not? No, we just have to do it, right? Because that's what has happened within all these spaces. So it's really important um, as I self-empowerment to say, well, no, we can't really do it that way, and this is why, and I don't need to necessarily explain to you um, in depth the whole history lesson unless you feel that you want to do that, right? But um, to approach it in a way of, of um, taking that power back of individually being able to say whether or not that's a, a good thing to do and, and why. And so, like... Um, Whatever um, 
emotive powers happen like within those spaces of the things that that people share or, or share like sometimes uh, people think oh well they overshared or or something it's like no if that emotive thing happened that was like for your healing probably or for my healing and if someone else couldn't necessarily um, grasp that or or accept it that that has to do with them not with the sharing right so I just think about like it isn't always um, everybody's responsibility as an indigenous creator or think a person of any kind to have to explain why or why not they don't want to, to engage in a certain way. And it, and it is a, a revolutionary act to say, I'm not going to do that. And you don't have to explain why. I don't think we do. I think that that's always promoted. Like there's always like we need to um, almost like pull too much energy from someone to make them like, overly explain something. And um, I think it's a, a good act to, to stand against that if, if needed, whatever possible. So uh, we, we're at, we're at the end, unfortunately. And I just once again want to take a moment to thank everyone who shared their voice today. It's, a, it's a beautiful to share this community with you uh, and to stand with you. Uh, um, and it's beautiful to feel like this feels a little bit like home. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your, for your presences and your bodies in the space. Uh, it, it's been a lot of thinking and feeling and looking work, uh, which is actual work, you know? Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, and let's put our hands together in gratitude for our friends to share. Thank you. I just wanted to remind you all that next week we will have our last set of panels, and the time will be the same, 12 to 4, but they'll be in a different room. So in UNC, um, which is the student union building, um, in the ballroom. So UNC 200, I believe, same time. See you then.